First of all, a good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to this uh, session on the co-creation funding. Uh, my name is Bert Meerman, as you see in, on, the, on the slide here. I am the director for the GoFair Foundation. And for the next 45 minutes or so, I will be your host in discussing the outcomes uh, and the impact on EOSC of a number of these so-called co-creation projects, CCPs, as we sometimes call them, the co-creation project. All these projects have been agreed earlier this year by EOSC, and they're now in different stages of the completion. So we are very anxious to hear about them, and we have a number of them lined up uh, over the next couple of days. Um, the common element of the project in this session is, is FAIR. Um, and uh, before, uh, let's say we go into the specifics, uh, I want to bring up uh, one slide because I want to say a few things about FAIR in general. And Frederico, maybe you can put up this one slide that I showed you or I gave you. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, so, um, you know, we all know uh, what, what FAIR stands for. Eh? It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And, and many of you, of course, have a very good understanding of all the different dimensions of this. Uh, still, I want to take the opportunity because we may have people on the, on the call that might not be at the same uh, pace here to, to say a few words about it, simply make three statements. First of all, uh, fair data is not equal to open and free data. We get this question very often. Uh, remember, data can be perfectly fair and at the same time be accessible only under clearly predefined conditions, uh, like a license, for instance. So it's absolutely not the same. Fair data is not the same as open and free data. Then <clears throat> statement number two, uh, fair data is not per se related to the human eye. Yeah? Fair data means that data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable by a machine. It's for machines. Yeah? Mind you, uh, simply having a nice website and a printable uh, PDF, for instance, is not enough to be fair. <clears throat> a machine, an algorithm, a smart query, needs to be able to find, access, and process the data and to find the metadata. Only then one can claim to be fair. And the third and final statement I'd like to make is that fair data should not, or, or should actually be as much as possible, remain under the control of the data owner. Uh, simply dumping data in a large data uh, warehouse, it is not necessarily fair in contrast Often we see that a decentralized federated structure is in our view uh, the best architecture to guarantee this statement in many cases. And this federation is also something that we're looking for within the EOS. So these are the three statements that I wanted to make. Um, now for the session of this afternoon, we have uh, four presentations, one skipped to tomorrow. And I suggest that each of us will have about five to, seven, five to six minutes to present the case, demonstrate his or her view and findings on the possible uh, impact also for the EOSC. Uh, I would say for the people on the call, use Slido as much as possible. The, the link is in the chat. Um, and then the idea is that let's say for about half an hour or so, we will do the presentations and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to have a question and answers as much as possible. Uh, so that's for the process. Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, we, we have, uh, we have uh, four very interesting subjects. We have uh, FAIR Forever by William Kilbride and Amy Curry. We have um, uh, Making Dark Data FAIR by Jack Casey. We have uh, a presentation about the semantic mapping framework by Dan Bruder. And we have uh, um, a presentation about Hardox, fair data in hardware and in product design by Jose Carlos Ura Dianusa. Uh, so that is the, uh, that's the program. 
And I would now like to invite uh, William and Amy for their first presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bert. I'll hand over to our, oh yeah, there it is. We've got our slides up. Uh, so that's good to go. And I just checked the sound quality is okay. There were some comments earlier that it was a little unclear. So I'll, I'll progress on the basis that all is well and let you all tell me if there's something wrong. So first of all, many thanks for the introduction, Bert, and a, and a warm welcome to the box room here uh, in Kilbride Towers. <laughs> I'm speaking you, to you from a rainy Glasgow this afternoon, and it's a pleasure uh, uh, to join you. And I'm joined today by uh, Amy Curry, uh, who is the project officer for the Fair Forever project. Do you want to say hello, Amy? Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, so we're going to do five minutes uh, now on this little project that we're involved in. Amy and I work for a slightly obscure little organization, but quite important in this context. We are the Digital Preservation Coalition, the DPC of the title. And the DPC is a not-for-profit membership organization working internationally, really, around issues of digital preservation. We have a, a big footprint in research, but we also have a big footprint across different sectors and agencies uh, around the world, including in banking and government and a range of, well, really all the contexts where this question of long-term access to digital materials uh, arises. So that's the context uh, of our work uh, and an introduction. Maybe we could move on to uh, the next slide, please. And I'll say that in a bit more detail. So the Fair Forever project, uh, is leaning on the capability of the Digital Preservation Coalition uh, and helping to examine uh, the needs to develop and monitor and to maintain uh, capability to preserve digital materials uh, in the context of EOSC. And let me also by way of introduction say by digital preservation we mean that very broadly defined all the activities, all the managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to information for as long as that information is needed or indeed processes uh, and applications uh, as well. Digital preservation, you'll know, is a fast moving field with really ubiquitous uh, relevance in which, however, capability is very unevenly distributed. Now, research disciplines uh, have made a substantial contribution uh, to the field in close alignment with the FAIR principles. Uh, and they've been delivered, preservation services have been delivered through complex specialist infrastructure that compromise, that, that compromise not simply technology, that's to say repositories, uh, but also staff uh, and policy. So all three of those uh, in alignment. Now, however, the pace of change of digital preservation is relatively rapid. And so what we find is that existing policy statements can sometimes, or existing standards, can sometimes fossilise practice uh, rather than enable uh, continual uh, kind of uh, energetic response to the digital preservation challenge. So that's our objective, is to assess the current strengths and weaknesses and the opportunities of preservation within the context of EOSC and look at how the open science community might benefit from the knowledge and experience of the wider preservation community as represented within the DPC. That's by way of introduction. Let's move on to what we're actually doing. I'll bring Amy in to discuss what we're actually doing, but we have really a very short project, to be honest, uh, uh, maybe three to four months. Uh, we're doing a lot of background research and data gathering. We're developing, therefore, an interim view, a hypothesis, which we will then test and currently are testing uh, in the context of interviews with a range uh, of EOSC uh, stakeholders, in particular, uh, the research infrastructure uh, partners. So Amy, do you want to say a bit about, add a little bit to the main activities? Sure, um, yep. So I realize we've got a, uh, just five minutes, but just to give the background. So the desk-based investigation, we looked at about uh, 30 documents and around 400 pages. And these were provided by the Sustainability Working Group, uh, include uh, work by uh, Horizon Europe, the uh, Shreya S3 clusters, basically every, uh, the larger stakeholders that we felt um, were relevant to our aims of assessing digital preservation. 
Uh, right now we are still in the midst of data collection and analysis. Uh, we are doing interviews with the 10 main uh, S3 and regional research infrastructures and projects. So we've gotten five of the 10 done and we have five on the way. Um, and so what we're using those interviews for is to uh, refine our initial interim statement. And so it's more of an iterative process. Okay, so shall we move on to the interim statement then, Amy? Do you want to slip, uh, move on to the next slide, please? So exactly. here's some uh, findings, uh, our interim statement. So a few observations from this work emerging, okay? So first of all, digital preservation is not explicit in the vision for EOSC, and in particular, uh, roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities uh, are opaque. So there's obviously some work to do uh, around uh, those uh, matters. Now, what are we actually saying there? Well, we think that there's a risk. We think there's a risk to data uh, and software and applications. We think there's a risk to reputation uh, and also to the sustainability uh, of the EOS vision arising from that opaque opacity, that um, lack of clarity uh, around where digital preservation responsibilities lie uh, within uh, EOSC. Uh, so we're trying to insert that thinking and trying to figure out where that thinking needs to be better placed. Obviously, this is an interim statement. And as Amy describes, our current process is to establish whether or not that's true, whether we're right, uh, and indeed whether that's a problem. Because it could be that uh, in some cases it's not a problem, in some cases that's perfectly uh, reasonable. Amy, do you want to add anything else around the interim statement and uh, our roadmap for the project? Sure. Um, the preservation roadmap, actually. Mm -hmm. So we started off with the review of documents. Those were kind of more top down. Our interviews were with different stakeholders, so we're kind of doing bottom up. Um, and right now, uh, we found that the interim statement, um, these, for the most part, are true, whether it is a problem. Uh, depends on a lot of things um, in terms of what data is being produced, whether it, there, how long a project is, uh, the different uh, issues that arrive with whether it's software, tools, and data, but uh, also in light of the new publications coming out in the symposium where the new SRA has digital preservation has been made more explicit. So in short, uh, our interim statements at this moment is it is not, uh, it's more explicit. The responsibilities are becoming clearer in terms of researcher responsibilities and identified stakeholders. Um, and where we want to do more uh, follow up research is talking to the working groups, to stakeholders to refine where preservation fits in terms of those roles and responsibilities. I think we have to round up, uh, so maybe you could uh, jump to the, to the last slide. Sure thing, so we're just on the last slide there. Our contact details are there, so please do follow up. We're open to the discussion. We welcome, if anyone wants to follow up or challenge our assessment or challenge our findings, please do, that we're exactly at the stage where it's right to do that. So please do get in touch. Uh, let me wrap up then by saying that we know that data, we know that uh, scientific research data and, and processes are born fragile. OK, the question is how fragile uh, and how much that is a problem for the long term uh, vision uh, of EOSC uh, and FAIR. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, colleagues, for your time this afternoon. OK, thank you very much, uh, uh, Amy and William also. So we now move to uh, the second session, which is about making dark data fair. It sounds a bit obscure, but uh, hopefully it is not. Uh, so I'm happy to give the word to Jack Casey from the TU Delft in, in Holland here. He will guide us through the world, uh, through the world of dark data. Brilliant. Thank you very much. But, um, cheers. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Jack Casey. I'm postdoc uh, working on this project, making dark data for, uh, unfortunately, uh, the PI uh, one can't be here today. He's teaching. Um, but yeah, I'm going to explain our, our overall project is the idea of making dark data first. So um, yeah, can we have the next slide, please? Cheers. Right, so the idea is, um, so the idea of dark data, some of you may know, um, the idea is, it's usually taken to be data which is for whatever reason, non-reusable uh, by relevant researchers. And by relevant researchers, I mean 
um, those who could otherwise be reasonably expected to utilize said data. Um, uh, common reasons for data being non-reusable include poor, data, poor metadata, um, non-standard formatting, um, and simply being forgotten about. So there's a variety of reasons why dark data, uh, data goes dark. Um, so we've got this little example at the bottom, research array collects some data, uh, stores it on a public drive, but doesn't label it properly. Um, everyone, everyone else can access that data, but they can't use it because they're not really sure what it is. Um, yeah, so that's a rough idea of what dark data is. Basically, it's non-reusable data. Uh, next slide, please. Cheers, right, so why care about dark data? Two main reasons. Um, our primary focus is on uh, HPC facilities, um, many of which are public funded. Uh, at least partly. Um, so for that reason, um, dark data can constitute a, a waste of public resources. Um, and secondly, um, there's obviously, if data is not being utilised properly, then it limits scientific progress. So those are just two reasons why to care about, why you should care about dark data. Um, next slide, please. Right, so after the first half of our work constitutes um, a kind of an analysis of how much data is actually dark. Um, this is more Wan's area. He has a background in computer science. I'm by trade, I'm a philosopher of science. Um, so, well, primarily that just consists of getting in contact with systems administrators. Um, and one way we've kind of um, broken down how, how much data is dark is by how much data is owned by deregistered users and inactive users, because um, the vast majority of that data um, isn't accessible. Um, so we've got um, we, we're still collating the figures, but it's something like, I think the rough estimate is about 8%, um, and earlier estimates were about 3 to 4%. Um, so that's the first part of our work, is working out how much um, data is dark. And it looks like a significant proportion. Next slide, please. And the second part of uh, the project um, is we're assessing the third principles themselves. Um, so obviously, as we mentioned, uh, and many of you will be familiar, uh, the third principle is concerned good data management very quickly. They constitute a call for data to be uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, our position is that the third principle should preclude the possibility of dark data. Um, if, if the third principles are doing the job that we want them to do, um, data shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't go dark, right? In other words, it shouldn't be possible that data be both dark and third compliant. Um, otherwise, what use are the third principles? So that's our assumption, our kind of base assumption. Um, next slide, please. Right, so uh, from that position, we think we've identified a gap in the third principles. Uh, our position is that essentially data can be, in principle, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, whilst nonetheless uh, being aptly described as dark. Now, this, this class of data, which we think we've identified, we call lost data. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, so lost data is this, um, this class of data which we think is both third compliant and also dark, right? So uh, data can be richly described, uh, it can have richly described metadata, um, can be in principle findable, entirely accessible, uh, formatted such that it's completely interoperable um, and entirely reusable for those reasons, but it can also be dark. Now, the, the reason for that is that um, nothing in the third principles precludes against um, the possibility that data just gets forgotten about. Right? This, is, this is the kind of gap that we think we've identified. Um, yeah, so nothing within the third principles precludes um, the possibility of data just being um, lost in the sense of it's forgotten about by relevant researchers. Um, so yeah, and there is, an ev there is evidence that a significant amount of data goes dark in this manner. So. Um, I've not got the I've not got the um, link here, but I think it's something like twenty five percent of um, data from studies from later than early in twenty years ago. Um, yeah, about twenty percent of that data is lost. Um, so yeah, next slide. Uh, yeah, so our, so our, our work right now is um, we've we've finished the arguments. Um, against uh, to, to argue that lost data constitutes this gap in the third principles and now our, our aim is to um, develop a suitable augmentation to the principles we call the result the third, third plus principles um, our main suggestion at this stage is to augment the role of a scientific data officer uh, this is a position that one um, 
argued for in an earlier paper. Um, yeah, so um, we suggest augmenting that uh, to preclude the possibility of data being lost in this manner. Um, or also to formalise the role of institutional memory, because we think that kind of an institutional memory is that which guards against um, data being lost in this manner. Uh, last slide. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions, um, although I'm not sure when that, um, that point is. But yeah, thank you. Hmm. Okay, this is very interesting. Thank you, thank you very much for this. I, I'm, I'm actually not sure if, if this goes against their principles. I think it's more, uh, let's say, the task of the metadata to actually take care of this. Because, you know, you can also have wrong data or rubbish data, but still perfectly fair. So, uh, but this is very interesting and we'll, uh, we will definitely look at this. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, Okay, I think the next speaker is Dan, Dan Bruder or Bruder uh, from the Claren Institute uh, about the, uh, the exercise of the semantic mapping framework. It's uh, Bruder Bert. Yeah, yeah it's Bruder, huh? <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Bert, for this um, introduction. Um, so I will be presenting you something about SEMAF, which is one of the EOS co-creation projects. Um, SEMAF stands for Semantic Mapping Framework. Um, it's a collaboration uh, between GEDA, which is a group of European data experts of uh, various uh, community origin, uh, mostly collaborating and discussing in an RDA context and the Clarin ERIC, which is not an institute, but a European research uh, consortium, uh, which is my own um, uh, affiliation. And uh, we wanted to do something to address the inter and cross discipline uh, semantic interoperability problems. So our goal is not immediately an implementation, but uh, rather a study and a proposal for a framework that supports pragmatic semantic mappings and, and crosswalks. Um, what do I mean by pragmatic? Well, that means that we don't want to solve all the problems of the world, but rather uh, try to concentrate on, on smaller problems, which are very real and where more sure that we can offer a solution. So we are targeted at specific interoperability goals. Um, uh, we want to make those uh, semantic mappings and crosswalk uh, uh, shared and, and published in open registries and of course made fair, uh, grounded in current practices and uh, building on existing resources. There's already quite some um, semantic mappings out there and we want to bring uh, dark things into the light um, and important we want to make it uh, reusable so make it easy for researchers to extend existing and create new mappings. Uh, our approach and work plan so um, just going into the second phase uh, we have uh, completed our task force uh, formation we have about 10 experts that have worked on semantic interoperability that have uh, relevant community expertise and more important support the pragmatic mapping approach. So in the first phase, we have completed our mission statement. Uh, there is a link later in the uh, uh, presentation if you're interested. Uh, we have our first set of requirements and refined goals uh, based on uh, the expertise of the task force itself. We have identified other community stakeholders and experts, and we have made a list of the relevant experts, such as the EOS interoperability framework report. And there are a few other uh, projects around that have done relevant things for us. We are now in the second phase, we just entered it this month. So we will conduct interviews with community experts on requirements and existing approaches. And we are inventorizing, uh, as I already said, the existing infrastructure and uh, semantic artifacts uh, that can be potentially integrated in an overarching SEMAF framework. So this is um, not the list of all of the requirements that we have already identified that would take too long. Just to give you an idea, we have classified the uh, requirements into uh, five classes. 
uh, one infrastructure and data model uh, where one requirement uh, um, that we agreed upon was that we want in fact the for a federation of registries, although the proposal will, of course, describe one, and if formulate a proposal, we will have one. But we think it should support a federation of such registries. And uh, with respect to user interface, we want to please uh, researchers that are in need of creating new mappings to have a easy user interface where they can specify mappings between semantic entities in a easy way. And of course, smart search and browse so that you can find work that has already been done. The other uh, requirements for what they are. So what's our current status? So we have our SEMAF task force with uh, 10 good experts, I think. We have our documents, the same of mission statements, but also as I uh, have shown you a uh, first phase of uh, requirements. Uh, we have an organization and expert. These are, I would say, our targets for uh, phase two, where we are going to interview those experts. Uh, the interviews are planned and we have our interview guidelines and interviewing is currently underway. So the status of our, uh, our project, and uh, if you think you can contribute something uh, to us and uh, want to be interviewed, please contact me and uh, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. I think this is very important. If we look at the, at the, uh, at, at the semantics, then we see that is probably one of the most important elements for the interoperability. Uh, exactly on every subject that we are talking about. So, yeah, and still underestimated as a challenge. Very underestimated. So thank you very much for that. Very, very good. Okay, I think now we come to the last session of this afternoon, which is Jose Carlos. And Jose Carlos wanted to demonstrate something. So uh, he is going to share the screen, his screen, so that we can see what he has been up to in terms of uh, hard docs. Jose Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bert. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think you, you can see my slides, right? Yep. All right. So, uh, OK, so uh, I, we're trying to uh, make hardware documentation fair, more user friendly, and intuitive. And um, we believe uh, that fair principles need to be enabled by design. So it's very important to indeed aim for them because uh, everyone benefits from that. But we also uh, think that uh, it should be evident that fair principles are, are needed by practitioners. So you should uh, just practice uh, uh, fair principles in your daily practice by documenting your projects, uh, your your work, and so on. And that's a challenge um, because metadata, in many regards, can be very tedious to generate, uh, especially after you finish a project. Or and maintaining that is also very tedious. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the at the trends of software development, there's a lot of metadata automation and package management and dependency management and things like that. And it's way more friendly in many regards. So our, our objective with this uh, co-creation uh, was to uh, address these needs uh, with a, a demonstration of a desktop application that allows to easily edit metadata and make it uh, user friendly and also connected to your file system to your local environment as much as possible. Uh, and we have tried, we have been aiming also for an offline and private first uh, approach to that as well. So you can have your the local database of metadata of documents in your in your computer first, and then uh, privately on the cloud, and then uh, open for everyone when 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 it's needed or or, or wanted. Uh, and we also want to enable the use of, uh, of metadata standards for now with uh, JSON schemas so that we can make sure that people can respect some standards uh, when they are generating their data. 
So I guess the first uh, I would try to do is just to show an example of that in in practice. This is a this is a. Can you see my my uh, yep. what are you, what are you seeing now? You can see the picture. It's a, like a pump. All right. So this is an example of the MIT uh, open source ventilator that was done for COVID nineteen, and this is an example. This is the application actually of uh, hard looks where we have now the demonstration. And here's a metadata, one of the metadata experiments we're doing to generate uh, such metadata about this project. Uh, this is one example of uh, previewing the metadata, but there is also another example where, let me show you just how to load a standard. Uh, this is in an early stage, but I guess for instance, if I want to select a standard of hardware design that someone specified in the internet, and I want to make my documentation compliant with that standard, I can choose a template, and this is just a demonstration, and you can edit it in this uh, editor. So this is just an example of how we're trying to enable that process during the, the same process in which you are documenting hardware design. And the idea is that also, because this is, gener this is generated from a schema, you could also validate it uh, even before uh, putting it outside on, on the internet. So, uh, you of course, you can add as many as you want. And this is just one example. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, this, is, this is an example of the prototype. And I wanted to talk a bit about the main co-creation activities. We made actually a first iteration uh, with a real um, hardware related equipment about, uh, about COVID. And we tried to use GitHub APIs and, and just a metadata standard on these repositories. And the main problem that we have is that content creation with metadata was very difficult uh, if it's not enabled. So we learned a lot from that experience and because the project was open source that allowed us to contact uh, contributors uh, in the world. And we actually are a team of four members now. One uh, member is in Nigeria, another one is in the US, another one is, and two of us are in the Netherlands. Santos is one of them and is present here. And then with that team that we already knew about the problem that we faced when solving the problem, the first uh, iteration, we started working on this app that I showed you. Uh, so we are trying to research through design uh, how we can make better uh, better experience of metadata editing and, and publishing. That's our goal. And the approach is just to try to have something that people can use so that we can get feedback from. Um, so the last, let's say, the, the, the last step of this, uh, of this work is actually to release what we have been doing and document it and publish it in a way that we can get more feedback from, from community of contributors. So the current results that we have and the findings that we have are that we first had a, we had a first release focused only on COVID-19 medical hardware designs. And we got feedback from content creators about how this worked and what problems they had. Uh, and then the expected results is that when we finish this, we are able to release again the, the, the next version, uh, which is a desktop app that I demonstrated and get again more feedback about practitioners to see if this actually solved their problem of creating metadata and generating and sharing metadata. So yeah. the key, you need the, to wrap up then because yeah. I have to go to the last slide if it's possible. Sure, you. sure. This is a, this can be the last slide. So the key findings is that uh, metadata is a need uh, and in, enable the first iteration. Instant search is important. The architecture, the open architectures are, are important as well. They enable uh, the, the process of sharing data. Uh, this is a transdisciplinary problem. It's not just a hardware problem. And we need a dedicated task force and open source, uh, and of course the funding to enable to have dedicated task force for this kind of projects. So that's pretty much yeah what we've been we've been up to in the last uh, months. So thank you very much. Super, I must say this makes me very happy. This is metadata by design. This is fair by by you know in the in the design phase of a new product. So that is uh, that is excellent. Sounds sounds very very good. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you very much. You, Carlos. Okay, let's, uh, I think we have now to move to uh, the questions and answers. Oh, I have them here. That's very good. There are already a number of, uh, of questions here. So uh, let's start. Why would we want all data that were in Dwell ever uh, produced to be fair? Simply not possible, feasible, nor necessary. Uh, I, I think that is something that I would then have to have to give to uh, Jack in terms of uh, Jack. Could you could you see what or could you articulate what 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 the value here is? Um, I think so. Yeah, I mean, we're taking it as a presumption that the third principles um, are a good idea. Um, but I think, um, yeah, the, the, the overarching idea behind the third principles is a good one. Um, but yeah, other than that, we're kind of just presuming that they are a good idea. So it's not really, our, our task isn't really, as we see it, isn't to defend the third principles themselves. It's to kind of check that they're working. We're taking that as a base assumption that it is a good idea to have. Uh, data that's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Okay, and then maybe also you can uh, answer the question if it's if it's not enough to have uh, the right metadata in a repository. If it's not, uh, if, is is that not uh, uh, basically already resolving it to to a large extent? So the idea of repositories is a good one. Um, the 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 problem is that you can kind of um, you can you can take the problem up another level right and repositories themselves can be lost um, the, the, the there's, there's nothing in the principles themselves that kind of guard against this idea of loss um, because I think the problem is really one of institutional memory um, and if you can lose individual sets of data then you can lose uh, collections of them um, with repositories and the the fur principles themselves don't really it, they're kind of ambiguous in so far in the call for um, uh, a repository because as somebody mentioned earlier there is um, th th there is a push within them it seems implicit for more decentralization uh, and if you if you if you go down this uh, this route of um, repositories as being the solution uh, for lost data then it, in some ways it can seem like a call for centralization. Um, so yeah, there is something of a tension there. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> good. Uh, then I do not see a lot of other questions, but they might be dropping in. In the in the meantime, I had a question for for uh, for Amy and for William, and that is what what do you exactly mean by the co-creative metadata, uh, and what is in your view the role of the community for this? I saw that in, in, in one of your slides, and I'm interested to find out what you what you mean by that co-creative metadata sorry i'm, I'm muted uh, so uh, a couple of observations here and it relates a little to what jack is saying perhaps as well so there's a there's a point at which preservation becomes possible okay now one of the strengths of eos is that it, it it pushes back into the community okay and that's important because the community knows what metadata requirements are in order for materials to be usable it's very difficult for someone outside of a research community to really know what the, uh, the metadata requirements would be for long-term preservation. I'm not talking about resource discovery metadata, by the way. I'm just talking about the representation information necessary for something to be renderable. So on one hand, there's a, a need for us to be speaking at a, effectively at a community level. And I think that's really the, some of the dark data, some of the questions that Jack's been discussing there. We need, uh, in some sense, to have that capability. But in the context of EOSC, that means a great deal of complexity, okay? Because there's a, a great deal of complexity in managing and maintaining all those relationships between that different uh, set of community uh, interactions. So for, for me, the fine discussion point or the fine balancing point is where should preservation take place? Does preservation take place at the point of creation Okay, in which case we need lots of researchers very capably trained in the ability to create the right metadata in the right place at the right time so that it's preservation ready at the point of creation. Uh, or do we leave that work to archivists after the fact? Do we leave it to services afterwards at the end of the life cycle of the data 
in which case uh, it seems to me that that's going to be tremendously expensive. But of course, it has the ability that means that a small specialist cadre uh, of preservationists uh, would be responsible for that. Now, I'm not sure yet what the right balance is, but I think we need to raise the level of debate around that to make that debate kind of more explicit, really, as mm -hmm. one of the forthcoming tensions, uh, implicit, if you like, in the, the FAIR principles and the EOS question. This is my answer. However, it's Amy who's doing the clever work uh, yeah. on this topic. I should hand to her. I mean, agreement, that's pretty much the direction it's going to is it, it relates to having the clear, uh, the clear uh, roles and responsibilities, at least having it clear within the larger vision. And also because it is a bottom, more of a bottom up thing, it, you're giving the onus of metadata either on um, researchers at the point of creation um, or if not, the data stewards to ensure that fair that data is fair and metadata is correct, but yeah, I, pretty much the same thing as William, and that's kind of what we're getting at too, which we're open for anyone's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, yeah, this is this is this is good. You know, my feeling is also that you know everything that can be done upfront, you know, let's 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 try to do it. But I can also see that not everything can be done upfront, so you end up with kind of a balance. Yeah, and there's a tension here as well. So like yeah. so. I'm an archaeologist. I yeah. create really good metadata in archaeology. Yeah. You're in the next field along. You're a geologist. How do you make sense of my metadata? I mean, this isn't a new question. Absolutely. But at scale, it becomes an important question. Okay. okay. I, I want to move on to another question. This is more a question for Dan. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, have you taken no. a look at a very interesting initiative? I... Bullet. First time I heard of it, which yeah. doesn't say anything. My colleagues might know it well. Uh, I'm just looking at the website and I'll, uh, I'll have a thorough look at it. Thank you. Yeah, well, it might, might be a good tip. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, excellent. Then uh, I have another question for uh, Jose Carlos. And, uh, you know, in terms of pr uh, these products, I'm interested to see if for instance, a, sim a simple algorithm or a query could determine the fairness of a hardware design. So I'm, I'm saying this with, in the back of my mind, some kind of an endorsement or maybe even a certification at, at a later stage. So do you see that as feasible? Uh, excuse me, do you mean the licensing of the design or? Yeah, I'm saying, you know, that even before you you are, let's say, building something, but already in the early stages that you define, let's say, certain fair principles to be included in the in the hardware later on for endorsement or for certifications, if other if certain, you know, certain companies are actually going to to build it, uh, because that that could be a good step forward, so I think if you could have a kind of a pre-endorsement based upon uh, you know what you want to build yeah so uh, the it's, it's an interesting point uh, the idea is that when you're writing for instance the application that i showed you you are already harvesting metadata about the user that is doing it uh, but also the structure of the documentation as well uh, and the idea is that any activity or note-taking process that you have in your normal process of designing can be already collected and structured in a way that you can easily share it. Because normally what happens is that you do something on paper or you do something on, uh, on, on Word or whatever, and then you figure out how you're going to publish it. But the idea is that in your, pro in your process of uh, taking notes, you can already use that to, to publish it right away. All right. Yeah. Okay. That makes it uh, clear. Very, very good. Thank you for that. And I think it's it's uh, three twenty nine. So I have time for one more question. Uh, Jack, question to you: uh, Can a strong presence of missing values in the data set make the data dark? If so, are there powerful algorithms to fill them? Have you seen that question? Do you have a good answer? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I, th I think so. The uh, kind of the answer to this question is. Um, yeah, there may be, but in that case, I'm not sure that they'd be fair compliant um, if there is, because the metadata might not be um, 
up to first standards. So if that was the case, then it would be dark for a different reason than the one that we're really concerned with. So, um, yeah, because we're primarily, con primarily concerned with data that fulfills all the criteria, but is still um, apt to be, be described as dark. If the, um, if the metadata is deficient, then it's non-FER compliant. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it's uh, three thirty, and I know that some people had to run for another call. So uh, I would like to end this Q and A session. Uh, thanks very much for attending this one. Uh, thanks very much, uh, especially for the panelists, of course, and the presenters.